Okay, so I'm Tsuyoshi Takagi, session chair of this, this, so this invited talk. So I'd like to introduce so Dr. So Dustin Moody. So he's a mathematician in the computer science division of the National Institute of Standards and Technology list. And Dr. Moody leads the post-quantum cryptography project at NIST. And he received his PhD from University of Washington in 2009, and his area of research deals with elliptic curves and their applications in cryptography. So he will talk about the NIST post-quantum competition today. So let's welcome so Dustin. Well, thank you, Tsuyoshi, and the other organizers for inviting me to come and talk. I'm grateful to be here representing NIST and talking about the, uh, the standardization project we have related to post-quantum cryptography. I know there's a wide variety of backgrounds, so I'll give a little bit of a basic introduction to just what post-quantum cryptography is, if you don't know, and then I'll get into what we're doing at NIST um, with a, a project that we've got going on. So I titled the talk, The Ship is Sailed. In English, that expression usually means you've missed an opportunity. And I'll explain how in one sense you have a little bit because the, we had a deadline that just passed last week. So if you don't know anything about it, you missed that deadline. But on the other hand, the ship is just barely starting to sail and we're gonna need everybody's help to get it to where it's going. So I'll talk about that. So just a little bit of the background, of course. We know that um, cryptography is based on a lot of different assumptions. And there's this new area of research that's dealing with quantum computers that's been happening over the past couple of decades. And it's going to have an impact in cryptography. So quantum computers are, are a very interesting thing. They're, they're designed using quantum mechanics and quantum physics that are different than the, the classical physics that are involved with the computers we use today. And because of that, they have some counterintuitive properties. Um, one of the main ones there is that the way they store information is, they call it qubits, which stands for quantum bits. And a qubit can hold information in superposition. So on our classical computers, if you have one bit, it's going to be either a zero or a one. Those are your only two options, and it's exactly one of those. But with a quantum computer, it can store a zero and a one at the same time in superposition. So that, that principle gets powerful when if you look at, if you have n qubits then, a quantum computer can hold two to the n different states in superposition, whereas a classical computer could hold just one state. And it's this, this right here, this potential for a huge increase in computational power that has people interested in quantum computers. Now, there are some difficulties with quantum computers, and that's why we don't have one that's built yet. Um, right now, people working on them, they have to do it in very environments that are very controlled and very fragile. And another one of the difficulties is if you take a measurement on your state, then you can lose some of that information. So you have to design your algorithm to take that into account. And people are working on that, and they're making tremendous progress along the way. So I put here some dates here, along with some papers that have been published that have claimed to use a certain number of qubits in their computations. Um, and you can see that that number has steadily gone up. And this year there's been uh, some impressive papers or, or results announced by, by research teams and companies. The number of qubits itself isn't the best way to kind of measure the progress of, a quantum, of, a, of research into quantum computing. But it does give you an idea of just that the field is progressing. Um, earlier this year, IBM put up a five qubit processor in the cloud. It looks like that right there. And they have that out there for anyone to experiment with. And they have also got a 16 qubit processor and they've announced that they're going to have, or they have a prototype for a 56 qubit uh, processor that they intend to put on the cloud as soon as possible. Google's also announced that they intend by the end of the year to have a 40-bit, 49-qubit quantum computer um, doing some experiments. I haven't seen that announced yet that they've achieved it, but that's, that's what they announced earlier on in the year. Now, the impact of cryptography comes from two main algorithms that most of you have probably heard of. The first is due to Peter Shore 
And he came out with this algorithm um, over 20 years ago. And he came up with an algorithm that would give an exponential speed up if implemented on a quantum computer, particularly that it would do two things that we might care about. It can factor large integers very efficiently, and it can solve the discrete log problem. So it would be able to do both of those in polynomial time, whereas right now, the best known algorithms uh, cannot do that. And Grover also came up with an algorithm um, that gave a quadratic speed up in basically kind of a brute force search. So an algorithm that now takes order of n steps, if you're able to use Grover's algorithm on a quantum computer, will only take O of square root of n steps. So both of those algorithms, in some sense, are a little bit destructive, or that they attack cryptography. But quantum computers also have a lot of other very positive applications. Um, people are doing research using quantum computers to construct crypto systems. Um, I'm not going to talk about that research at all, but there's a lot of people who are involved with that. And there's a lot of other very exciting and interesting applications uh, dealing with science and physics. That um, I'm also not going to spend time talking about that because I don't. It's not my my area of expertise. So that. To talk a little bit more about what is the impact on cryptography, so I work at NIST, that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and one of the, the primary things that we do in my group is we write cryptographic standards for the United States government. And we know that other people as well use the, the crypto that we standardize, so it gets used by industry around the world as well. And this is a little chart that shows some of the standards that we have in different areas of cryptography. There's public key algorithms, there's symmetric key algorithms, algorithms like AES and SHA-3, hash functions. We have some more kind of guideline um, documents that give you information on how to transition or how to protect your keys and so forth. Um, we have documents on random number generators. Um, there's a lot of different doc documents in cryptography that we, we've standardized. So what would be the impact from a large scale quantum computer on these documents that we have here, the crypto that gets used in the real world. Well, if we had a large-scale computer that could implement Shor's algorithm, um, as I said, it would break, or it would, it would solve the problem of being able to factor efficiently, and it would also be able to solve the discrete log problem. Those are the two main problems that the public key crypto algorithms that we use today uh, base their security on. So public key cryptography would be pretty much completely wiped out if we get a working quantum computer that can do um, large-scale computations. There's also an impact on symmetric key crypto, although the impact there is not as big. Because of Grover's algorithm, um, if you were to do a brute force to try and, say, find a key for AES-256, um, you potentially only need to do 2 to the 128 operations because of that quadratic speed up you get. So there will be an impact on symmetric key crypto, but we can remedy that by using longer keys or by using longer hash function output. So the, the, the way to get around that isn't as difficult as it is for uh, the public key crypto algorithms that we need to completely replace because we can't just use bigger keys. They become way too inefficient. So that's what this field here, uh, known as post-quantum cryptography, is dealing with. It's the search for crypto systems, which will be implemented on a classical computer, but are resistant to attacks from a quantum computer. Because even when the first quantum computers are developed, they're not, you know, they're not going to be widespread. We're still going to be using the, the standard computers that we all have. So we need the crypto systems to still work on classical computers. They just have to be able to protect against attacks from one of these quantum computers that gets developed. So this field is also given other names sometimes. It's referred to as quantum safe or quantum resistant. Um, things of that nature. Um, and post-quantum cryptography is a very, very growing field right now. This chart here is, uh, shows the citations of Peter Shor's uh, 1995 paper, and you can see it's just steadily going up, and it will probably continue to do so for the next several years. And even though it's growing, though, post-quantum cryptography, we also don't feel that it's at a mature state where we have all the answers at this point. So we still need more time to do more research and analysis so we can have confidence in the, um, the crypto systems that we're trying to use to replace the ones that will be broken. So what type of things are being looked at for post-quantum cryptography? 
Well, there's a wide variety of, of areas that are. Um, most of the proposals have kind of fallen into three main families of um, kind of mathematics that they come from. The first is dealing with lattices. Um, there will be several talks at this uh, conference on lattice-based crypto. And there's a lot of um, proposals for both encryption, for signatures, for, for a key establishment using lattices. And they can do that fairly efficiently. Fairly efficiently. The key sizes uh, don't look too bad. So they look like a very promising area. Um, the second main family is what's called code-based cryptography. And that's using error-correcting codes. And they have been around for a long time. Um, a well-known one due to McLeese was actually uh, discovered, I think, in 1979. And it still is unbroken today, and it's believed to be resistant. Um, there are no known quantum attacks which, which break it. Um, the third family is using multivariate uh, algebra. So you're using quadratic polynomials uh, in several variables over a finite field. They've had a lot of success designing signature schemes that are, are very efficient and have good properties. Um, there are some encryption schemes that are based on multivariate, but, but they haven't had quite as much the track record as the signatures have. Um, and then besides those three main families as well, there's, there's a variety of other things that have been proposed. Um, there are hash-based signatures. And those are schemes that are based entirely off of hash functions. And you can, you can take the security of the signature scheme and tie it back directly to hash functions. And we have a very good understanding of how that works. Um, recently, there's been a lot of work in what's called isogeny base. So that looks at isogenies between super singular curves and designs some crypto systems there. And the talk after this one, we'll talk a little bit more about some signature schemes that have been developed in that area. And then there's kind of, there's some other families that people have proposed, but these are kind of the ones that get the most attention. Um, as we've been studying these at NIST, they all have several good properties, but every one of them also has some kind of drawback as well. And so you can't just conclude that we have an obvious um, crypto system that it's natural to select because it outperforms all the rest and it has the best key sizes. They all have their pros and cons, so it makes it a little bit of a, a challenge to try and find the best one. So I'm not going to get into the details of those kind of mathematical families, but I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about what, we, what we're doing at NIST in relation to post-quantum cryptography and standardization. So there's been a lot of talk about whether we should be working on standardization with post-quantum crypto or not. Um, some people think the field isn't mature enough. Um, other people think we need to get going as fast as we can and work on this. Uh, the question that drives all of this, of course, is when will we have a large-scale quantum computer? If we're not going to have one for 100 years, there's no point in working on this very fast right now. On the other hand, if it's due any time, we need to have standards ready. And of course, nobody completely knows the answer to when will, a, will we have a quantum computer. It's an active area of research. People are working on it. There are experts in the, in the field, though, that have given some estimates. And I've just put one of them here. This is from Mike Mosca. Um, he's well known in the field. And he actually put his estimate in writing, which is a little bit unusual, it seems like. But uh, in a paper last year, he gave a one in seven chance that we'd have a quantum computer that could break RSA 2048, basically, in 10 years. And he thought within 15 years, there was a, a one in two chance that we would have a working quantum computer. And there are some other estimates from other people that, that work in the field that have given similar estimates of anywhere from 10, 15, 20 years as a possibility for having quantum computers. There are, there are other people that are skeptical of that timeline, so we, we don't completely know. Our experience at NIST says that we need several years to standardize an algorithm. If we look back at the experience of elliptic curve cryptography, for example, um, the first papers in elliptic curves were proposed in 1985. It wasn't until around uh, 2000 and shortly thereafter that standards were written for elliptic curve cryptography. And it wasn't even then for another 5, 10, 15 years that people started using it and it started getting deployed and into products. So standardization takes a long time um, from our experience. And that helps us uh, inform our decision that we take on uh, standardization with post-quantum cryptography. 
Mike Moska also has a nice little theorem that kind of puts this into perspective to know if, if this is something that you should be worried about or your organization to be worried about. So he calls it a little theorem and it involves just three variables, X, Y, and Z. So X is how long you need your information to be secure. And that will depend on who you are for how long or what number you put in for X. Y is how long it's going to take to come up with new crypto systems, standardize them, deploy and get them in products, um, so retooling the, the infrastructure. And Z is how long until you have a large scale quantum computer. So his theorem simply says if X plus Y is greater than Z, then you probably need to worry a little bit. Because somebody could take your information right now that you've encrypted and they could just copy it and they could sit on it and in Z years later when a quantum computer's out there, they'd be able to get that information um, sooner than the X years of protection that you want them to provide. So you can put in some numbers for X, Y, and Z to see if you need to worry or if you don't need to worry. Um, for Z, we saw in the last slide that there's estimates of Z that are 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, for how long Y is, at, a, at the absolute minimum, I would say you can't do it faster than five years, but more realistically, maybe 10 years or even 15 years. And X depends, again, just on who you are. If you're protecting national level secrets, X might need to be 30 years or longer. Maybe it's only five or 10 years, depending on who you are. So if you put in some of those numbers, you know, if the quantum computer's here in 10, 15 years, then yeah, it seems like we, we very well may need to be working on this um, to get standardization going with this. So with this backdrop, the, the National Security Agency, the NSA, they, on their webpage, they put a, a statement out that got a lot of people's attention. The National Security Agency doesn't give a lot of public statements about cryptography, so when this came out, people noticed it, especially because they were talking about post-quantum cryptography. And on their webpage, they said that they, were they, were, they would initiate a transition to quantum-resistant algorithms in the not-too-distant future. And that makes sense because the NSA is protecting secrets that they need secure for a long time, so they need to have that information protected sooner than probably other people. And it's also going to be a very slow transition for them, so it, it, it totally makes sense that they're looking at this now. But the announcement got a lot of people's attention and, and saw that the NSA is taking this seriously and they're taking steps to, to work on this. And that got a lot of people of industry and, and so forth very interested in the, in the field as well. And they said, well, we need standards as kind of the first step to really get going on this. So at NIST, about that same time, we made the decision that it was time to kind of start taking more concrete steps towards standardization. And we didn't want to simply just look at all the research and then pick an algorithm and say, this is going to be the algorithm that we're going to standardize and use. We wanted to do a process that we would help kind of manage and organize and run, and that we would do so in a timely and a transparent fashion so that we could get some good standards out of this. Um, we don't expect to pick a winner out of all this. So what we're hoping is that at the end of this, uh, we think it's likely there will be several different crypto systems which emerge that have good properties that will satisfy most people's minimum requirements and so that there will be several algorithms that we standardize as a result of this. So a little bit of our, our timeline that we've been working on this at NIST. Um, our projects got put together in earnest around 2012 where we started getting more and more people involved with it um, and having regular meetings. We held a workshop in April of 2015 that had a lot of people from academia, industry, and government there. There was a couple hundred people there. Um, the NSA gave their statement in August. And in February, we, we released a report giving this perspective on post-quantum cryptography. It's a very short report. If you want to learn more, um, you, can, you can read it. It's easy to understand. And that same month, we went to PQ Crypto and we gave an announcement that we would be launching a, a major standardization effort in regards to post-quantum cryptography. And that was well supported by the, the research community in that field. The remainder of 2016, we put out our submission requirements and evaluation criteria. We first did that in draft form so people could give us feedback and give us comments on that. And then we finalized it about a year ago and put that out so that people would know what we were looking for. 
basically we were calling for people to submit post-quantum crypto algorithms so that we could then have a kind of a competition-like process to, to search for which algorithms would be standardized. And we announced the deadline would be November 30th of 2017, which was last week. So our team here, uh, we, we want to be open and transparent as possible about it, who's working on it and so forth. We have 12 researchers right now and we're actively trying to recruit more. Um, they have a, we have a wide variety of backgrounds in quantum information, quantum algorithms, people with mathematics backgrounds and so forth. And we've been meeting and holding seminars amongst ourselves, having invited speakers come in and give talks with us so that we could be aware of what's going on. We've been doing research and publishing results in journals and conferences as well and engaging with the, the post-quantum research community. Uh, we've been interacting with industry and other standards organizations, and I'll, I'll talk about that on a, a later slide. We've also been just trying to raise awareness among the government in particular so that agencies would know that there's a transition that would be coming and that they, they'll need to do something about it. So here's kind of the, the timeline of our um, standardization plan. We officially kind of don't call it a contest or a competition, although we know everybody else does, and we sometimes ourselves call it that. Um, but the deadline, as I said, was last week. It was last Thursday at midnight. And the next thing that will kind of happen, well, there will be a workshop in April coming up. It will be held in Florida, joined with the PQ Crypto Workshop. And that workshop will be for submitters to present the algorithms that they submitted to us. So if you want to, to learn more about the submissions, you can go to that. And that will kick off an analysis phase of about three to five years. Internally, we'll be analyzing the algorithms, and we hope the rest of the crypto community as well is doing that, because we don't have enough resources to, to do all this on our own. Um, that three to five years will be broken down. There will be a few different rounds where, where we'll kind of, after the first round, we'll, we'll choose some algorithms to move on to the next round that seem like they have a better chance of being ready for standardization so that we, have, we can better focus on a smaller number of algorithms each time. And along the way, we'll release reports on our, our rationale for the selections that we make and the, and the progress that we have going on. So the, the hope is in uh, around five years from now that if all goes smoothly, there will have been a lot of work done and a lot of research done so that we can select algorithms for standardization and then we'll write the standards documents and that can take one to two years for that to happen. So the scope of what we were asking for, there was three different functionalities that, that we wanted. And that's to replace the standards that would be broken. We have FIPS 186 that had our digital signatures, things like um, RSA, ECDSA, DSA. Those would be broken, so we need new public key digital signature algorithms. Uh, we also had uh, two standards documents, Special Publications 856A and B, which deal with key establishment. So using things like Diffie-Hellman or using RSA key transport. So we were also looking for encryption and key establishment as well to replace those algorithms that would be broken. And because we're, we're focusing on just the simplest primitives that will be needed for post-quantum cryptography, these are the three functionalities that we wanted to start with and not anything else besides these. Now in many ways this will be similar to the, the competitions that NIST has run in the past similar to the, the SHA-3 competition that ended not too long ago, or the AES competition. But in other ways, it, it's different from those sorts of things. Um, Post-quantum cryptography is a lot more complicated than those competitions were. There's a lot of different mathematical techniques and structures that are, that are involved. Um, there's lattices, there's codes, there's multivariate, there's isogenies. There's all sorts of things going on that we kind of have to look at all at the same time. And none of these algorithms, as I said before, is kind of the silver bullet that is just going to solve all our problems. It's a very active area of research as well um, that's going on here. We have people working on quantum, quantum algorithms that are trying to attack some of these systems. And there, there hasn't been as much research as we, we feel we need to really trust the security of some of these crypto systems. So it's just very, very complicated in that sense. As I mentioned before as well, we also don't expect to have one winner. With the SHA-3 competition, KCHAP was the winner. Every other submission was not the winner. 
And that's different with this. We expect to standardize more than one algorithm. And for each functionality, we expect that there will probably be a few different algorithms. So for signatures, we could have two, three, maybe a few more uh, post-quantum algorithms that we, that we standardize. Um, we're also, as we narrow down our focus for each round, that doesn't mean if an algorithm wasn't selected that it could never be standardized. Like with the, the SHA-3 competition, if, if you weren't selected to move on, your algorithm was done because there was only going to be one algorithm. We're, we're looking to, to come up with the first algorithms that would get standardized, but if the research shows that there's a particular algorithm that we didn't get selected, and it's, it's doing really well, and we trust its security and has good performance, that algorithm could still be selected later on for standardization. So we're just trying to find the first algorithms to be standardized. And we also want to make it clear that our requirements and our timeline for all of this could change based on developments in the field. It's a very active area of research. If there's new results that cause us to, to need to change things, then we'll do that. So in our call, we put forth some minimal acceptability requirements that we wanted all the submissions to meet. So we wanted them to be publicly, disclo publicly disclosed, freely available so that people around the world could work on these submissions and look at the implementations um, without any restrictions in that way. Uh, we, of course, want these algorithms to be implemented in a wide variety of platforms. They needed to be either signature schemes, encryption schemes, or do key establishment. Um, they need to give, give us some evidence, both theoretically and empirically, about the security claims that they make. And they also needed to give concrete parameters for target security levels. So we couldn't, we didn't want just an academic paper that says this would make a nice crypto system. We also needed concrete parameter settings that told us, okay, this is how much security this provides. So the selection criteria that we'll be using to judge this, uh, number one is security. That's, that's obviously the most important. Um, it needs to be resistant to attacks from both classical computers and quantum computers. And then after that, performance. Uh, performance is obviously important, uh, measured on a variety of platforms. And then after that, there's kind of a wish list of properties that we hope these algorithms will get as many of these as possible. So as much as possible, we'd like them to be drop-in replacements in the protocols that will use them. So if you can put it in TLA, TLS with no changes, that would be ideal. Um, that might not, might not be possible. Um, they can provide perfect forward secrecy or provide resistance to side channel attacks, um, so on and so forth. Um, any other properties above and beyond are, are obviously a plus. So we put our, our call for proposals out and uh, we asked for feedback on it and we got a lot of feedback from, from people. Uh, there was 26 people or organizations that responded back and gave us um, some mm -hmm. criticism or suggestions. If you go to our website that I have links to on here, you can see what all those are. We gave her a we gave a report on what we changed as a result and why and so forth. Most of the suggestions or comments were for just minor things to change some of the wording or to, to clarify what we'd written. Um, the main things that people have questions about. Uh, so the way we approach key establishment. Uh, people suggested that we use the framework of key encapsulation mechanisms, that that would capture what we were wanting to do better. And algorithms like the Diffie Hellman can easily be put in that framework. So we, we went with that suggestion, which confused some people and other people liked it. Um, but the new, the final call for proposals that we had asked for algorithms to be described using um, that framework as a key, uh, key encapsulation mechanism. And then the other thing that there was a lot of discussion on or comments on dealt with how we approach quantum security and um, target security levels that we asked for. Uh, being at NIST, we needed to have, we needed to be able to say, okay, this algorithm provides this much security and be able to quantify that. And there's not a consensus way as how to measure quantum security in the field right now. So we put forth an idea and then a lot of other people had comments about that. And we modified what we'd originally done and I'll, I'll show what we, we ended up with. Um, there were suggestions on uh, our API and, and other things. But. So along the ways we've been doing this, there, there have been a lot of complexities that have arisen in this process. Um, because we're dealing with three primitives and not just one, 
when it was the SHA-3 work uh, competition, it was just a hash function we were looking at, so everything involved that. But now there's three primitives, which in a sense kind of makes it three times as hard. Uh, we also have to look at both attacks from a classical computer and a quantum computer. So classical algorithms and quantum algorithms, which is a complexity. And research in quantum algorithms isn't as far along as it is with classical computers, of course. So it's, it's, a, it's a growing area of research that you, you have to try and take the results that are published and do as much of what you can with them. Um, yeah, and there's all sorts of other just difficult things that have, that have cropped up as, as we've gone along there. Um, I won't go into everything that's on there. but So the security analysis, uh, we gave some security definitions that we wanted the submitters to try and target. We initially asked for encryption and for key establishment, um, indifferentiability, CCA2. Uh, people suggested that we include uh, CPA as well, so that you can have more ephemeral use cases, so we did that um, for signatures, uh, existential unforgeability, what we were looking for, and we'd use those to judge whether an attack was relevant. So we wanted submitters to, to target that. We Security proofs would be great, but they weren't completely required. Uh, submitters, we wanted them to talk about the quantum and classical algorithm complexity. A large part of that will be a classical security analysis because that's what's most developed and most of the initial attacks against these crypto systems are going to be run on classical computers, so it's important to look at that. Uh, and then we also wanted to know as much as possible about how much crypto analysis has already been done on this. So quantum security, it's a, it's a difficult thing to measure and, and there's a lot of uncertainty because it's, it's still being researched. Um, it's also difficult because we don't have a quantum computer, so we don't know how fast algorithms will be run on it. We don't know what the cost will be in time or memory or dollars or anything like that. But we still, at NIST, to write our standards, we needed to be able to kind of put a number on how much security these things were, were providing. So for a classical crypto right now, we do that by saying, okay, it's got 128 bits of security or 256 bits of security. And initially, we wanted to do the same thing and say, okay, this provides 128 bits of security, uh, of quantum security, and just kind of put a very simple number on it. Um, a lot of people disagreed with that approach, so we ended up having to change that a little bit. And this is what we ended up doing. It makes it a little bit easier for us here at NIST, although we realized for submitters that were doing this, this, this was a little bit harder to do. So we had five security levels. Security level one means to break this crypto system, it'll take at least as many resources as it would take to break AES-128 doing an exhaustive key search. Um, and then similar, the algorithm, or levels three and five were defined for just higher secure levels of AES. And then levels two and four were defined using a similar thing, but looking for collisions on a hash function. So we wanted submitters to try and measure how much resources it would take to, say, break with AES-128, and then see how many resources it would take to attack your proposal that you're submitting, and then tell us which level that you would, uh, you would fit in under here. We know that this is a, like, not easy for submitters, so we understand these are just kind of preliminary estimates that submitters will be giving us. But that allows us to begin to at least kind of compare two different crypto systems. If they're both in level one, then they're providing roughly the same amount of security, so we can we can start to compare them that way. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how we've defined it. We want people to, to measure using a variety of metrics. It's not a very concrete thing at all. So we understand that this is a very kind of preliminary estimate, and we hope that this will get firmed up in the next couple of years with more research. So we want algorithms to perform well on uh, classical computers. From what we've been looking at, uh, a lot of these algorithms, efficiency-wise, they seem like they'll be OK. They might not be quite as fast as some of the things we do, but they're not order of magnitude slower. And some of them are, are, are faster than what we use today. So efficiency in that way, we look to be in somewhat of pretty good shape, that it's not going to be a showstopper. Um, However, there's a variety of applications that these are going to need to go in. So there's lightweight crypto applications. 
So some algorithms might, might be better for them than on others. So that's another reason why we might need to standardize more than one algorithm to target different applications. Um, looking at the performance though, key sizes are something that looks like that very well could be challenging. Most of the post-quantum crypto proposals, the key sizes that they're proposing are a lot bigger than what we currently use in practice today. So if we have to put them in protocols like TLS and Ike, that might require changes to those protocols, which would be a, possibly a very painful thing to do. Um, so this might be a little hard to see, it looks like, but so the PQC stack, so there's applications at the top like web browsers and certificates and, and some of these applications that will be using the first post-quantum algorithms. Uh, we're focusing right here on the, the primitives, like I've said before, the encryption, signature, and key exchange primitives that will get used in these applications. So as much as possible, we want them to be drop-in replacements into things like TLS and Ike. Um, that may or may not be successful. Like currently, Diffie-Hellman gets used a lot. The algorithms that we have today for post-quantum proposals, there's not one that functions exactly like Diffie-Hellman that you could just plug right in. So there might, might, might need to be some changes there. Um, might have to use some encryption with one-time public keys. Uh, similarly with signatures, many of the proposals that we're looking at have larger signature sizes um, than what we might be used to right now. So there have also been just little challenges along the way that when we started we might not have been thinking about, but as people have asked us questions and so on that we've had to kind of take into account. Um, these schemes are relatively new and so there hasn't necessarily been lots of research dealing with them. And some of them have just little peculiar things that we're not used to. For example, decryption failure. The schemes we use today, you encrypt, you decrypt, and it works. There's not decryption failures. Several post-quantum schemes, there's a small percentage chance that if you encrypt correctly and you correctly decrypt, that there might be an error that you don't get out the message that you started with. So you have to work that in and, and know how to manage that decryption failure. Um, for some of the algorithms, like hash-based signatures, they need state. And we haven't had to previously manage the state of the public key crypto algorithms that we use. Um, and things like that. So we'll have to move away from some of the things that we're used to and try out some new things. All right, um, to talk a little bit more about the submissions that we have received. So we put an initial deadline at the end of September where we said submitters could submit to us. We would take a look at them. We would see if they met all our requirements that we were asking for, and then we would tell them so that they could know if they, they had everything in, the, in there that they needed to do. So at the end of September, we received 37 submissions. Um, we didn't know how many we would get. 37 seemed like a pretty good number. 10 of those were signature schemes, and 27 were encryption or chem schemes, or sometimes a submission had uh, both formulations. Of the 37, the, the most of them were lattice schemes. Almost half of them were lattice, and then code-based and multivariate. And the remaining 10 were kind of a mix based of several different things, hash functions or isogenies, or other interesting ideas that were, were put in there. And they came from all over the world as well. Of the 37 that were submitted to us, I think only seven completely met all our requirements. Uh, many of them almost did. They just had small difficulties in, uh, in the known answer test that we asked for. We put forth a specific API that got a lot of kind of questions and discussion that was being worked on close to the deadline. And so there was just some implementation issues that they hadn't done quite the way we were asking for, so they needed to fix those. All right, and our, our final submission deadline was last Thursday, so I can tell you a little bit about the, the number of submissions that we received. We can't give out specific details on individual submissions at this point. Um, the first thing that we're doing when we receive these is we're doing a, a review to, to check if a submission met all our, our requirements, or to, if, to use the official words, if it's complete and proper. And those submissions which are complete and proper, then we'll make those publicly available. 
but we don't want to give information about a specific scheme and then it ends up not being complete and proper. So I can just kind of give more summary information at this time. It's also been really soon since it happened. Uh, the deadline was midnight and I flew out the very next morning so I haven't had a lot of time to, to synthesize everything. But we, we received a total of 82 different submissions, so a little more than double what we had for the preliminary. And that includes the preliminary submissions as well. So the, there was 37 in, submitted initially, and all but one or two of them <coughs> submitted their algorithms again uh, for, a, for a total of 82. Uh, 23 of them were signatures, and 59 were encryption or key establishment or key encapsulation mechanisms. Got a little timeline here so you can see the obvious spikes were our preliminary deadline and then on our final deadline. So the day before the final deadline, we had something around 40 submissions received and then the last day that doubled. So everyone waited till the last day. They didn't wait till the last minute. We got submissions steadily throughout the whole day. Almost every 15 minutes or every half an hour we were getting submissions, but definitely the most on the last day there. If you have a submission, I'm sorry, but it's too late, so don't send us any more submissions. We have 82, and that's enough for us right now. Um, just to break it down a little bit further to kind of classify the type that we received. So the signatures, uh, four were lattice-based, five were code-based, seven were multivariate, four were hash-based or kind of in some way symmetric key-based, um, and then three that came from some other kind of grab bag of... Um, the type of math that it was using. For the CAM encryptions, the most were with lattices and then code base by far, and then there was six multivariate and 10 that were using some other um, technique that they wanted to do for encryption CAMs. And then you can see the overall there. So lattices and codes and multivariate, uh, those are the three families that have been described for several years as kind of the three main families and that's reflected in the submissions that we did receive. I was looking at where they came from. They came from all over the world. They came from every continent except Antarctica, um, 16 states, 25 countries, and six continents. So if there's a pin, it means that one of the submitters was from one of these countries. So we did get some from here in Asia. There's people from China, South Korea, Japan, um, Looks like Hong Kong, Singapore, yeah. So from all over the world, this is interesting to see. So there will, there will need to be a transition that's upcoming because uh, we will be moving to post-quantum algorithms. Um, we don't have that advice yet because we don't have the standards ready, but we will issue guidance when the, when the time gets near. Until then, we recommend you continue to follow the guidance that we've given before. Um, we have a document that, that tells that. Specifically, you should be using 128 bits of security or higher. Um, and if you're using less than that, you should, you should transition. There's been a lot of talk about it. Using a hybrid mode is one of the ways to transition to post-quantum algorithms. And that's the idea that you take a, a classical algorithm and you combine it with a post-quantum one in such a way that you have to break both to, to break the crypto system. And that makes a lot of sense. That seems a very sensible way to to transition. Um, we've got questions before that people have asked, can that be validated under FIPS validation? Um, as it is right now, yes it could if someone wanted to start doing a hybrid mode right now, although the validation would only be validating the, uh, the classical algorithm, not the public key one, because that's what we're looking for right now. So we're, NIST isn't the only standards organization that's interested in post-quantum cryptography and, and working with it. Um, there have been several other organizations. Uh, we're collaborating and coordinating and, and talking with all of them. So IEEE P1363, they had stat, uh, standards in lattice-based crypto for a number of years. Um, it's, it's standardized some lattice-based schemes. The IETF right now is actively working on hash-based signatures. Um, they have a couple of two different proposals that have had RFCs and have been making a lot of progress. It's very likely that they'll be done soon, and those algorithms are stateful hash-based signature schemes, which are outside of kind of the scope of what uh, we're doing at NIST with this, this standardization call. The API that we wrote 
stateful hash-based signature schemes are unlikely to fit that. So we do think, though, because we, we're confident in their security, because it's tied directly to the security of hash functions, they're an early candidate for standardization. So it's very likely that whatever the IETF standardizes here soon, that we'll also follow their lead and, and standardize the same um, ones that they do. Uh, Etsy has been very active. They've been holding regular workshops and writing reports in this field. We've attended those, presented at them. We've contributed to the reports they're writing. We, we coordinate closely with them. Um, there's other groups like Peaky Crypto and Safe Crypto that have made recommendations, and we, we talk with them, so we're on the same page. ISO has been looking at quantum resistant cryptography. They've had several study periods. One of the, the main people working with that is uh, my boss, Lily Chen, here at NIST, so we're very tied in with that as well. So there's a lot going on besides just at NIST as well. Um, we have a forum online, a PQC forum, that allows anyone to ask questions or to discuss with each other. It's been a very, it's a, a good place for people to ask, ask questions and discuss a lot of these issues. Um, there's instructions on our webpage for how to sign up down there, and you can, you can view the archives. To kind of summarize a little bit about what's been discussed, um, a wide range of topics. Some of the more popular ones uh, have involved our API and how to use randomness correctly in your post-quantum algorithm. That got a lot of a lot more detail than probably most people wanted. Um, using third-party libraries, questions about kind of the details of submission and so forth. Um, a lot of discussions on classical security strength, quantum security strength, best way to measure it. There's active discussions going on right now, even the past day or two, almost even uh, people that don't agree, I'll say, um, are discussing these things. So what to expect next? We are, we're doing our review to, to check all these 82 submissions to see if they've met our submission requirements. As soon as that's done, we'll post them on our webpage so that everyone knows what those submissions are and they can start working on them. We're hoping that it will be done this month in December. Um, might not happen, but that's what we're, we're working for is our goal. Uh, the next workshop will be in April. It'll be in Florida, jointly with PQ Crypto. And that, again, will be where submitters can come and present their algorithms. There's a large number of submitters, so it's going to be a, a somewhat of a tight schedule, but we'll, we'll make it work somehow. And then that will kick off about a, a year and a half of kind of analysis on all these initial submissions that were submitted. And at the end of that, there will be another workshop or conference. Oh, so we've got all these kind of a timeline. It just summarizes what we have there. So just in summary, um, quantum computers have huge potential to do amazing things. They'll have an impact in cryptography. The main impact will be that they, they break various public key crypto algorithms, so we're going to need to replace those. Uh, we've started a, a big standardization prog uh, program to look for the algorithms that we'll need in the future. We've seen a whole lot of uncertainty, a whole lot of complexity in the first uh, year or two, however long we've been doing this. And we expect that to continue. People often don't have these questions until like when they were actually working on their submission. And then they say, well, your call doesn't really describe what I'm, what I'm dealing with here. So we expect that to continue. Uh, we expect to transition in around 10 years or so to new algorithms, new post-quantum crypto algorithms. And we're really grateful for all the support and feedback that we've got from the crypto community at large. And we hope to continue to working with you because we can't do this on our own. And it'll take all of our effort to, to get the ship going to where it needs to go. So with that, I thank you for your time. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. OK. We still have time. So questions? Ah, yes. What is this going to do about the, frankly, poor quality of discussions on the forum? It's a toxic atmosphere at the moment. Are you going to do anything about that? Um, it is a public forum, so people are free to say what they want to say. If, if it gets you know, really bad, we can moderate it, we can ban people, and so forth. Um, people get a little heated sometimes, so we want them to, to be polite to each other and so forth, but it is a public forum. and. We hope to not have to moderate it um, in that way. 
זה כסף. What are your plans about decertifying existing algorithms, public key algorithms? Are you going to wait until a large scale quantum computer is actually built or are you going to be uh, uh, very cautious and decertify algorithms at a much earlier stage? That's a, that's a great question. So currently at this point, our standards allow for their use and that's all we have, so we want people to continue to use them. Um, as time progresses, and it looks like we have more firm estimates on when a quantum computer might be around, we could give uh, updated timelines for when you would need to stop using them and so forth. Um, at this point, it's all in the future, but that is something that might happen. It's hard to say exactly at this point, but we do, I do think we would have guidelines. We've done it in the past. Whenever an algorithm is discovered that, that has a weakness or has a security issue, we've, we've given timelines and said, you need to start transitioning away by this date and so forth. So that would likely continue in the future. Is that question? We still have time. So I can see the behind. So help I will. So bring the microphone. Small question. Okay. It seems no question. All right. If okay. you have more questions, you can send them to us. Uh, we have all the links are there. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, this, is, this, is a, this is a small present from the Thank you very much, Jacob. Okay, next session will start at so 10.25, so we have so about seven minutes break. Okay. Yeah.